we are highly privileged. I'm so glad that we are here. Praise the Lord. We, oh, wonderful, wonderful. We have our brethren from Abuja here. Wow. Thank you, my loving brother. And uh, Pastor Daniel, Pastor Kevin, you are wonderful, wonderful people. You came all the way since uh, yesterday. What a journey. Thank you for the sacrifice. We have our brethren from Abeokuta here too. Sorry, from Ota area here. That is wonderful. Thank you for the journey. Pastor Joseph, you are wonderful. Our brethren from Portacourt, you are wonderful, wonderful. Reverend Ben, Reverend A.K. Swiss, Reverend Nisi, all of us, we are wonderful, wonderful people. Thank you so much for coming. And equally, we have our brethren from Baeza State. As we go on in the meeting, I'll be seeing your faces, and we'll be able to interact together the more. Thank you for coming. Our brethren from Abba, you are very much welcome. Our brethren from Bori, as well as Weri, wow, you are welcome. Apostle uh, David, you are welcome. God bless you. It's wonderful, wonderful. We want to thank God for our loving prophetess, Christy and the husband. Oh, this is marvelous. Thank you for being here. It's, it's great that we are able to see you. I want to thank God on the behalf of our brother whom God has spared his life for us. Wow. Thank you God for the life of Patrick. How God has spared him. I want to thank God for the brethren in Obia Roko, the brethren all over supporting and praying and assisting and encouraging those sending money, those sending help, sending prayers. You are all wonderful. Thank you so, so much. I want to thank God on the behalf of our Father who happened to gather us together to, you know, host this meeting. And it has been wonderful the energy, the strength, the input. Thank you so much, Pastor Sam. May God Almighty bless you. Uh, before we go into our interaction, I just want to share with you uh, this uh, passage of the scriptures. But before we share the passage, let's look to the face of God to hear what God wants to tell us. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, you are God, and you alone is God. There is none like you. There is none we can compare to you. You alone reign it. You have called every one of us for a purpose. You have brought us here for a purpose. You have come to make us to walk in a new path for a purpose. Father, we pray that none of us will miss your plans for our lives. And Lord, we pray that you will give us grace to be able to fulfill the ministry you have given unto us. 
We thank you, Father, because we know you have answered our prayers. Lead us as we look at your word. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, let's open our eyes now as we open our Bible. Let's look at John chapter 14. I want to read verse 6. John 14, verse 6. Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In this passage of the scriptures, there is a question that looks so simple. In this passage of the scriptures, we see Jesus talking about what he is for. And that gives me the topic of our discussion shortly now. The four initiative. Four. F-O-R. Initiative. Now, here in this stakeholders meeting, I want to consider just a simple question. And the question is, which, it looks so simple, but it's a big, big question. There is a word that we use commonly in life, and that is the word for. F-O-R. The word for is used to indicate an object or aim or purpose of action and activity. In another place, it could mean to indicate a kind of destination. I am for heaven. I am going to so and so. The word for. And the word for is to indicate the object of desire. This is what I'm standing for. Your intention or your perspection. Another way is to say that, you know, if I come over now to Abba, for example, and then Sister Christie is going to entertain. She prepared me lunch. That lunch is for me. The reception of that lunch from her simplifies the word for, for the pastor, the lunch for the pastor. So we realize that the reception, the beneficiary of an action or activity, that word is used for it. Now, maybe I'm supposed to be in a meeting and I'm not able to attend that meeting. Somebody goes there to stand for me, so to represent. So Jesus Christ here is telling us, he said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the lie. No one comes to the Father except through me. So in that place, Jesus declared what? He was for. So two things. The word for stands on two questions. The first question is, what do you want to be known for? That talks about your personal identity. What do you want to be known for? That is the uniqueness in you. 
that is your vision. That is talking about what you want people to say about you in the marketplace. What you want them to think each time they talk about your company, your association, each time they talk about your church, each time they talk about your family, each time they mention your name, what do you want people to know you for? The question is very clear. That is the first question, what you want to be known for. The second question is, what are you actually known for? The first question is, what do you want to be known for? The second question is, what are you known for? Because what you are known for is the customer's answer to your product. Is the customer's answer to your person. Is the customer's answer to the way they look at you and judge you and be able to say, this pastor or this minister or this sister or this woman or this man is this that is the market value they have for you that's what they know you for and we need to realize when these two questions what you want to be known for and what you are known for when the two of them matches then you create sales for yourself. And that's why we are looking at four initiatives. Why? You create sales for yourself. It's the positive word of mouth advertisement. That is the public image that people have about you. Somebody was writing in his book, Scott Cook said, a brand is no longer what it tells the customer that it is. A brand is what one customer tells another customer that it is. And that is the thing we need to understand. That is the word of mouth advertising. One customer, somebody has been to your church, he has benefited from your church, he has learned from your church, he has, he has gained something from your church. It's not you now telling people about the church, but that fellow now goes out and says, you know that pastor, you know that individual, you know that child, you know that woman, this is what he is, or this is what she is. That's what they know you for. Then they begin to advertise you to other people. When people go out, your members go out and they are telling all the other people and say, you need to come and see our pastor because they believe in you, they know you, the product itself is now is another customer telling another customer about the product that you are selling. The four initiative. You remember, Joshua, when the Gibeonites were telling him about what they have had, their own story about him, look at what they said. In Joshua chapter 9 verse 9, they replied and said unto him, Your servant have come from far away land because of the reputation of the Lord your God. For we have heard of his fame and all that he did in Egypt. So that's what it's known for. Now, two things before us today. What you want to be known for, which I titled as personal identity. 
what do you want to be known for? Because Jesus declared and told them, I am the way, the truth, and the lie. That is what he wants to be known for. That is where he wants everyone to understand. And he declared that there is no other way to the Father except me. That nullifies every other thing that anybody may say, whichever route anybody wants to take, whichever road anybody wants to take. So anywhere to the Father is only through Him. Then that one defines who He is. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No other way to go to the Father apart from me. Okay, Jesus told us who He is. The question is this, as you come to this meeting, ask yourself, who are you? Write down. Because he's talking about your person and your calling. And there are some guiding principles that will help you to be able to define yourself, to be able to know who you are. Who are you? Let me take you through these uh, six points. Because if you don't know who you are, there's no way you'll be able to project yourself. Number one, how do you declare who you are? Number one, you must be a lover of Jesus. Because that is an identity that you need to carry. The love of Jesus. You must love Jesus for your salvation. You love Jesus for your security. You love Jesus for your strength. If you are not a lover of Jesus, you can't be a minister for the gospel. And this is very, very major. The strength Jesus has provided, the salvation he has provided, the security he has provided. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the lie. So, you need to identify yourself under that umbrella, the law of Jesus. And we are made to understand in John chapter 10, verses 28 and 29. Jesus said, I give them eternal life. And they will never perish. Ever. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. No. Nobody. So, to define who you are, Ask yourself the question, do you love Jesus? Number two, to define yourself who you are, do you love your spouse? The pastor must love the spouse. Why? Because God commands it. Two, it is a consecration that God has given for blessing the whole. Three, is a companion that God has given to you to keep you till death. That's the reason why you must love your spouse. Number one, you love your spouse because it's a command from God. You can't say <laughs> you love your spouse and the two of you have a little difference and you establish your own. Your own must be the one that has to walk. No, it doesn't go that way. How do you demonstrate that you love your spouse? Even though if the two of you are having disagreement on one issue, because, you know, when it comes to decision making in a family, it's a teamwork. We make decisions together in the family. So if you claim, I love my wife, I love my spouse, I love my husband, the two of you will come to the table and you dilate, you discuss, you discuss, you look at the matter together and then you listen to your spouse. You understand your spouse and you compromise with your spouse. When you don't come to an agreement, listen to our own version or listen to his own version. 
when you listen to his own version or you listen to our own version, you understand her. And then you compromise. Why are you compromising? Because out of the love that you have for this woman or you have for this man, the love makes you to want to see to the benefit, to the best that can be in this individual. You want to be your best and act your best for this individual. That's to show that you love your wife. Now that the wife talks, you say, come on, go and sit down. You're a woman. You don't need to talk. Or the man talks, well, uh, you don't have anything in the house that you are bringing to the house, so I don't have anything, any respect for you. You sit down together. You discuss together. That is love. You can't claim that you love your wife and something is paining your wife and affecting your wife and you, you don't give a damn. Just do whatever you feel you want to do. Your wife says, okay, this your discussion with uh, uh, this person or the way you are dressing or the way you are talking to people in the church or the way you approach issues, I don't like it. If you love her, you will listen to her. But when you don't listen to her, you just do whatever you want to do. I am the man. You are the woman. You don't have anything to say. It shows you don't love her. No. Now the Bible says, God made us to understand that as long as you have that woman with you, you are to share your love with the woman. Romans chapter 7, verses 1 and 2 tells us that, that you are in this relationship for life. So, better know how to love your wife and then you go through. Number three, you must be a lover of prayer. Number one, you love Jesus. Number two, you love your spouse. Number three, you love prayer. Because you must love prayer because prayer is the connection you have between yourself and God. That's why you must love prayer. Like the telephone will carry up and down. Telephone is the link between you and outside yourself. You link through the telephone with your friends. You link through the telephone with your neighbors. You link through the telephone with other extended members of your family. So, that's how it goes. Because you love prayer. It's the connection you have between now, between yourself and God. That's why we love prayer. It draws you nearer to God. That's why you love prayers. And it's the only means of communication with God to depend upon Him. That's why we pray. Somebody was saying, if God knows everything and God is sovereign, why do we need to pray? Since He knows about our need, it's not that we are making God to know about our need. Our prayer is just a symbol of dependence upon God. We are simply telling God, God, I depend upon you. I can't do anything on my own. That is the means. Because it's the means of communication. One is the means of connection that draws us closer to God. It's the means of communication. That means he's depending upon God. And then he's the means of our collection. We collect from God. We don't have the power on our own. We can't even help ourselves. So we depend upon God to collect from Him. That's why you need to love prayer. Paul the Apostle tells us in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20, said, Now to Him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask. He can do beyond and above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. He can do above all that we ask. He can act above all that we think because he can go beyond all that we are thinking. So you need to love prayer. Number four, you must love preaching. You love preaching. And uh, you preach because that's our calling. You pray because that is the counsel he has given unto us. You pray because it's the control. Whenever you preach, you are preaching because you are called to preach. 
And you are not preaching yourself, you are preaching him. Number two, you preach because it is cancelled. You are exhorted to preach, declare the word of God. In season, out of season, either they will hear or doubt. Preach. You preach because it is control. He is the one that will tell you and share with you what you are having. He is the preach and you have the backing of God on what you are saying. So let's understand that. No wonder Paul the Apostle says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is God's power for salvation to everyone who believe, either Jew or Gentile. That's Romans 1, 16. That we preach the word, we declare it, we say it, for people to see. Then, number five, there must be love of fellowship. In fact, we need to love fellowship because that is the strength of our collision. We love fellowship because fellowship is very crucial. We love fellowship because fellowship is compulsory. We love fellowship because fellowship is for covering. Psalm 133 tells us the cruciality of fellowship that brethren should be together they must work together they must go together they must operate together not only that hebrew 10 20 tells us the compulsion the compulsory nature of fellowship he said we should not forsake it and the covering of fellowship we are made to understand in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11. Therefore, encourage one another, build each other up as you are already doing. That is fellowship. Then, number six, there must be love of soul of man. If that is why we are all gathered here, see all the journeys you made travel from all these different sections to our travel to be in worry. See the preparation. See the way that, see the money you have spent. See the effort. See the goals. Because you love the souls of men. You love the souls of men because of the significance of their soul. You love the souls of men because of the seriousness of their soul. You love the souls of men because of the supreme nature of their soul. What's the seriousness of it? You know, anytime anybody does not make any arrangement or make reconciliation with God here, when that fellow dies, he goes to hell. That's how serious it is. The horror of hell makes us to love souls. Number two, a minister loves souls because you know that it is supreme. You love souls of men because you know the happiness that awaits the saints on the last day. The seriousness, the significance is there. Bible tells us very clearly in the significance it says, for what does he profit a man? If he gains the whole world and loses his soul, what can a man give in exchange for his life? It was even Jesus Christ that said that. So we need to love souls of men. So six things that should justify all, six things that will help all, six things that will assist us, you must love Jesus. Two, you must love your spouse. You must love prayer. You must love preaching. You must love fellowship and love the souls of men. Now, having discussed with every one of us about who we are, what you want to be known for, that is the guiding principle. The love of Jesus, the love of your spouse, the love of fellowship, the love of souls of men, the love of preaching, the love of prayer. It's very, very major for us. Then, let's look at public image that people are having about us. In John chapter 14, I want to read verse 6 again. Jesus told them, he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
Jesus projected this to the whole world. It is clear from the scriptures that what Jesus wanted to be known for is exactly what he was known for. He balanced the two. How do I know that? In Mark chapter 7, verse 37, the Bible tells, tells us that they were extremely astonished and said, He has done everything well. He even, make, he even makes deaf people hear and people unable to speak talk. This is what you call positive word of mouth advertisement. And uh, Jesus says, I am the way, and the truth, and life. When Jesus was busy doing the work, people now saw it and said, wow, he did everything well. The lame, the blind, the weak, the feeble, all of them, he made everything well. Look at that same Jesus. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, the Bible says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippa, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? He wants to get the feedback. And they said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, see, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But you, he asked them, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Messiah, the Son of the Living God. So, the people that are far testify about it. They tell us what they know him for. The people that are near tell us about it. They tell us what they know him for. Peter, very close to him, told us, you are the very Messiah. People that are far, who don't come near him so frequently, told us he did all things well. So, the public image of Jesus Christ was consistent to the end. In fact, when he died on the cross of Calvary, the centurion, one of the soldiers that was there, said, This man truly is a righteous man. You see that testimony in Luke chapter 23, verse 47. This man truly is a righteous man. Because they were able to understand what was going on. So the fundamental building block for four initiative is what you want to be known for is what you are known for. And that one is going to really help us. And people gather together unto Jesus because when you what you want to be known for is what you are known for, you become attractive. You magnetize. You attract the people to yourself. You, you pull them to yourself. Because what you want to be known for is what you are known for. That is the essence of what we are having as a coalition. We want people to know us for loving Jesus, for loving our spouse, for loving fellowship, for loving the souls of men, for loving preaching, for loving prayer. We want people to know us for that. Then at the end, if you are able to have all this, then we have what you call people gathered together unto us. The thing which I'm sharing with you now is not a strange thing because God has allowed it to happen in my ministry. I was transferred to Delta State a couple of years ago and I have a desire to make Jesus known. And that desire was fulfilled that to the extent that members were going out from my church to tell people outside they don't even preach anything too much to them again just come and see our pastor and god was honoring himself what i wanted to be known for was what i was known for and then i was able to break ground i got the church at about 800 membership 
I left it at 4,000 to the glory of God. So let's understand that when you understand this principle of four initiative, then you are able to go through the positive image, the positive public image that you have gives you what you call passionate inviters. And that is what we are lacking in the church. When you have 100 members, and the 100 members refer to the church, not as their church, but as our church. That is our church. Until you are able to get some members who can be able to look at your church and say, that is my church. And you are able to look at your members who can say, that is my pastor. No matter what anybody is saying, I stand by my pastor. I walk with my pastor. I love my pastor. I'm passionate about my pastor. When you have those passionate inviters into the church, then you will grow. But when you don't have the passionate inviters into the church, then you will not grow. Your growth will be limited. Because people that are talking against you are more than the people that are talking for you. People that are standing with you are so few. And that is the reason why, if you look at the case of Esther, in Esther chapter 9, verse 4, the Bible says, For Mordecai exercise great power in the palace. Now look at what followed. It's not that he was exercising the power and people were talking bad about him. No. He exercised great power in the palace. And his fame spread throughout the province as he became more and more powerful. And that is to show you that he's exercising that power. He's going on in the way that God himself has chosen him. He became famous to everyone. Listen, my brethren. When a pastor enters, maybe you travel from Obiaruko. You get to worry. You take a picture of yourself in a car park or in the garage, or in the motor park. And then you take the picture of yourself in the motor park and you paste it on the Facebook, pastor on the mission to wherever you are going. And then you are praying in the church for somebody. And then maybe, by the grace of God, either they push him down or the fellows fell on his own or whatever happened, Put it on the Facebook. You know the indication that one is showing us is this. That you don't have passionate inviters in the church. So the best way to do it is to project yourself. I use Facebook. Yes. That is true. To announce to the people, we are going for a program in this place. But to take every picture in that place and show some other things in that place, that's it's because there's no inviter, no personal inviter, no people, no people are passionate about your ministry and they want to make it known. That's why we do all that. Let me tell you something, brethren. Nothing happens in your ministry unless somebody says something. Somebody must say your ministry. Somebody must say you. Somebody must project you. Somebody must tell people about you. That is the four initiatives who are for you. In the days of Moses, Moses asked, who is on the lost side? Who are for you? The church is a community. We need to create a culture of peculiarity in the church. And that's what we shake the image, the negative imagination that people are having about the church. The culture of peculiarity for the church. 
Let me tell you four things that build a culture of peculiarity. Number one, a church that is going to project a very good image will have what you call church affinity, common affinity, sorry. There must be that affirmation where two or three are gathered together in my name. I'm there in the midst. I'm there among them. Two or three of them. There is this affinity. There is this common affinity. Something that binds everybody in that place together. Your members are seeing themselves as a family. Just one family. Come on. Band together. Until that is done, there's no way you can get a public image where there is division in the church. Brother A is fighting Sister B. Sister B is fighting Sister C. Sister C is fighting Sister D. And they were having all these problems within there. There is no affinity. Then number two, there must be common attraction. Common attraction. What do I mean by common attraction? Jesus gave us the parable. If one has hundred sheep and one of them is lost, he said he will leave the ninety-nine to go out there to the lost one. Now that one goes with our slogan, all for one, one for all. And that is what we need to realize. That we are all staying there as relatives. We are together. We are all. Everyone is essential. For the entire body. When you are in need, spiritual need, I'm there to help you. Physical need, I'm there to help you. In every area, we are helping one another, encouraging one another, assisting one another, one for all, all for one. That is the common attraction. Then we have what you call common advantage. Abraham was telling Lord, my brother don't leave me alone. Stay with me. For we are brethren. We are family. We are relatives. There must be common band. All these divisions we are having in the church. All these separations we are having in the church. It's not helping the church. It's not assisting the church. So there is need for us to be together. And... Go as one. There must be family bond. Then there must be common attitude. What do I mean by common attitude? Peter came to Jesus Christ and said, How many times will my brother offend me and I forgive him? Jesus said, 70 times 7. And we need to understand. Functioning in the spirit, in the sweet spirit of the kingdom of God here. The word will help us to help build the culture of peculiarity to raise passionate inviters for the church to grow. Do you remember? Let me end up with this story. Uh, this woman, the Samaritan woman, came to Jesus. Asked Jesus whether I can get something to fetch the water and then be able to Jesus now showed her how things will go. And Jesus shared with her uh, the way of salvation. When the woman received it, the woman went out and told everybody, come see a man who told me all that I did. Is this not the Christ? The Bible told us in John chapter 4, verse 39, now, many of the Samaritans from that time believed in him because of what the woman said when she testified. He told me everything I ever did. Therefore, when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them because a passionate inviter has gone out. Our prayer in this meeting is that God Almighty will give us passionate inviters, compelling them, bringing them. The image the people are having about our church will affect the growth of our church. 
And I want to assure you, brethren, in this journey as we have come together, let the four initiatives stand there for you. Because what you stand for, every one of us here today, 23 or 25, I don't know the number that is there now, that are sitting down here today, your own four initiative is going to affect the totality of Shapok. It's going to affect our standing. What you stand for will affect the entire body. So that's why you must stand to love Jesus, to love your spouse, to love prayer, to love preaching, to love the souls of men, and to love fellowship. And that's why you must have a kind of commonality of affinity, of attraction, of advantage, of attitude. I pray that God who has brought us together will keep us to the end. Let's pray. We are going to be having sessions of prayers now and we want to talk to God as a family that God Almighty, the purpose why he has brought you to this collision, the law will fulfill it. Let's pray in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. As we go into the sections of prayers now, we pray that your Holy Spirit will lead us through. Blessed be your name. Thank you for our meeting today. Thank you, Father, because you will see us through. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.